Good morning. Nice to be back. Uh, this morning is uh, it's, it's a practical hammer, and I'd like to start off with something that I think is kind of a creed for the world and move from that into what I think is the most, and that's what it's called this morning, what is the most important question for a Christian to answer? What is the most important question for a Christian to answer? This is called The Creed by Steve Turner. We believe in Marx, Freud, and Darwin. We believe everything is okay as long as you don't hurt anyone, to the best of your definition of hurt and to the best of your knowledge of okay. We believe in unconfined sex before, during, and after marriage. We believe in the therapy of sin. We believe that adultery is good fun. We believe that sodomy is okay. We believe that taboos are taboo. We believe that everything is getting better despite some evidence to the contrary. We believe in UFOs and mindfulness and bent spoons. Jesus was a good man just like Buddha and Muhammad and ourselves. He was a good moral teacher, although we think some of his good morals were bad. We believe that all religions are basically the same. They all believe in love and goodness. They only differ in matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, and salvation. We believe that after death comes the nothing. Because when you ask the dead what happens, they say nothing. But if death is not the end... If the dead have lied, then it's compulsory heaven for all, excepting perhaps Hitler, Stalin, and Genghis Khan. We believe that man is essentially good. It's only his behavior that lets him down. We believe that each man must find the truth that is right for him. Reality will adapt accordingly. The universe will readjust. History will alter. We believe that there is no absolute truth, accepting the truth that there is no absolute truth. P.S. If chance be the father of all flesh, disaster is his rainbow in the sky. And when you hear state of emergency, sniper kills ten, post-birth abortion, bomb blasts school, It is but the sound of man worshiping his maker. But you say, I do not worship man. I worship God. What is that? What is that creed? What is that that worldly creed? What does that have to do with me? I, I don't believe that. Well, what do you believe? Well, I, I, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Trinity. I think I know why there's suffering. I think I know how I should live my life. I, I, believe, I, believe, I believe Jesus existed. I believe... Well, I don't work with Marx or Freud or Darwin. And, and, and state of emergency and snipers, and that's... Nothing close to who I am. So, so then I would ask you, where do you get these ideas of Jesus and suffering and the Trinity? Why not follow Marx or Freud or Darwin? And here's where we come to the most important question. All of these statements, all of these things that we believe... They have one source of authority, and that's the Bible. Everything that you may have thought when we first started, that's the most important question to answer, has one source of authority. It's the Bible. So for me today, the most important question is, 
why do you choose to believe in the Bible? So you just put yourself, you know, you've seen these things on television. Somebody accosts you on the sidewalk and sticks a microphone in your face, yeah? And says, are you a Christian? And you go, oh, yes, yes, I'm a Christian. Why do you choose to believe in the Bible? Well, I'm going to give you three examples of the, the, these are the best of the worst. The very worst of the worst is, uh, because, what was the question? That, That would be really bad. So here they are. I believe the Bible because it's the Word of God. Okay. Where do you get this idea of God? Well, you know, from, from the Bible. Oh, dang. That's kind of circular. Ah, oh, yes. Well, but it's, yeah, okay. Well, there's another one. I believe in the Bible because that's the way I was raised. Okay. And the third one, it worked for me. Now, you may say, well, those are, those are my answers. I, I said, I, that, those are my answers. If you're going to take those answers away from me, you better replace them with something good. Well, I'll do my best. Let's start with, with uh, I believe the Bible because that's the way I was raised. This is very common in the Netherlands where a lot of people were raised Catholic. Are you a Christian? I was raised Catholic. Okay. As if that's an answer for why you might believe something your neighbor doesn't. It implies that you're brought up one way and, and, and you're, like a, you're like an hourglass glued to the table, you know? And, and it just goes one way and the Bible just happened to be part of that way. The problem is it gives automatic credibility to people who were raised another way. Oh, I don't know, like a Muslim, a devout Muslim. So well, I was raised a different way. Well, I, I was raised to believe this. And you can see already, well, then if my way of being raised is legitimate, well, then your way of being raised is legitimate and your way of being raised is legitimate. And so we come to what we very often hear today. That's your truth. That's your truth. I talk to my students and I say, no, truth is true for all the past. It's true for everyone now and everyone in the future. Can we come up with a truth like that? And everybody looks at their toe caps. Oh, I don't know about, oh, no, we can't do that. We might say something about that on Wednesday night. I think finally it doesn't actually answer the question of why you choose to believe in the Bible. I'll go to the third one. It worked for me. I tried it. It changed my life. I was in a hotel room 20 years ago and I cracked open a Gideon's Bible and it fell by the grace of God to Romans 5. And by the time I got to Romans 8, I was in tears on my knees confessing a lifetime of sin to the Father of the one who provided the way out, changed my life. My marriage is better. I stopped drinking. Changed my, it worked for me. You can't believe what it did. Well, your experience is important. But unfortunately, it doesn't prove anything. I have an illustration. Young man, grew, grew up, he was born in, in, in Omaha, Nebraska. His father was murdered. His mother w- had mental issues, mental health issues, and was placed in an institution. So he and his brothers and sisters were put into foster care. When his sister was emancipated, became 18 years old, she was living in Massachusetts. And so he went to live with her. And he young kid coming out of foster care, he got into trouble. He was on the streets. He was pimping. He was thieving. He was running numbers. And predictably, he went to prison. 
In prison, someone confronted him about his need to bend the knee to the Messiah. His reply, from his autobiography, I never have and I never will. He goes on to say that one night, the Messiah visited him in his prison cell. He was able to bend the knee. He was able to surrender his life. He was a changed man. Complete. He was so changed, they let him out early. He became a lecturer and a minister. He founded hundreds of houses of, worships, uh, 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 houses of worship across the United States of America. And streets are named after him today. His name? Malcolm X, Minister for the Nation of Islam. His Messiah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You see, Malcolm X tried the Nation of Islam. It worked for him. It changed his life. He died preaching it. It worked for me is not a compelling reason to choose to believe in the Bible. But here's something that may be. I believe in the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical events written by eyewitnesses in the time of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that were fulfillments of specific prophecies, and they claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. It's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses in the time of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events which are a result of specific prophecies, and their claim is that their writings are divine and not human in origin. That, that pretty much sums it up. But why should you believe me? Well, I stole it. <clears throat> I stole that from uh, Vody uh, Balcom, a uh, Baptist minister from Houston, Texas, and he stole it from 2 Peter 1. Let me read it to you. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses in the time of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events which were fulfillments of specific prophecies, and they claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. I want you to give that exact answer when you are asked the question. Well, I've memorized Shakespeare since high school. Well, this is a challenge for all of you, okay? Because if you're like the people on YouTube... Most of the answers are, well, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm brought up that way. It works for me. I, I don't know. I think it's, you know, I, it's my truth and you have your truth. All these kind of wimpy things. But that's not why you believe. What I just said to you, that's actually why you believe. I hope you look at it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. It's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses 
When other eyewitnesses are standing there, yeah, we saw that. Written by eyewitness is in the time of other eyewitnesses. Yeah, they, repli- they, they, they report supernatural events that were the results of specific prophecies. It's hanging back there over the coffee. And they claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. I'm going to take each one of those four statements. I'm going to give you some cool stuff, and then we're going to close. It is a reliable collection of historical documents. They're just such great stuff. Just, 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 just lean back and just enjoy this. You can have a copy of it. There are 53, 53 characters from the Old Testament that are historically referenced people from the Old Testament that we have found in archaeological digs. There are 24,000 archaeological digs. If any archaeological dig had found anything contradicting Christianity, you would hear about it. A couple years ago, they had, do you remember this? They had the Jesus ossuary, the bone box. It said Jesus on there. Ah, we got him. By the time the guy that was talking about this was on TV, it had been debunked for two years. But man, CNN, they wanted to get him on there. Nothing has come up. Five Egyptian pharaohs, one king of Moab, five kings from Aram Damascus, eight kings from northern Israel, one Sumerian, six, six kings from uh, uh, southern Judah, eight other officials, five kings of Assyria, one prince, three kings of Babylon, four officials, five kings of Persia, plus one governor. I'll add to that, they found the pool of Siloam. The signet ring of the prophet Isaiah, and they know it because it says on the ring, the prophet Isaiah. The house of David, references to the house of David. Well, David was a fiction. References to the house of, uh, of David in Moabite texts. It's there. In the New Testament, 5,300 Greek manuscripts, full and partial. There are no theological disagreements Bart Ehrman comes out and says there are 250,000 errors in the Bible. There aren't 250,000 words in the Bible. Okay? And these things are just very, very small. So, but if you take 5,300 and they all agree with each other, and there are a couple, there are a couple missed words and there's some punctuation. Of course, Greek, ancient Greek doesn't have the punctuation, so when, you come, when it starts to be translated after that, you, you get punctuation issues. That's it. That's it. Papyrus called 5345 from Egypt, the Gospel of Mark. For, you, for those of you who have studied um, you know, when, when the books of the Bible were actually written, this Gospel of Mark is from 70 A.D. Jesus was crucified, give or take, in 33. We have a copy in 70 A.D. We have a copy from Mark from 150 A.D. We have a copy in the Rylands, uh, the Rylands Library Papyrus, uh, the Gospel of John, 117. This isn't even 100 years after, after Jesus. And we have early copies and early Roman historians that confirm that Christians worshipped Christ as God from the beginning. It is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses in the time of other eyewitnesses. All books of the Bible were written by apostles or their followers and and had uh, people who had seen the life of the Messiah and the risen Christ. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, James, and Paul are all contemporaries of these people knew each other. They argued with each other. Numerous eyewitnesses to Christ. So uh, Corinthians 15, 6, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time most of whom are still living. There's not a document found, not a document found that says, you know, Paul's walking around and I was there and I don't know what the big deal is because, you know, Jesus' body was just laying there. He was dead as a doornail. There's nothing out there, nothing. All the things that most of the, most of the atheists referred to are from the third and fourth centuries. They're from writings that were two or three hundred years later but nothing from the time. 
Luke 24, 13 to 31, just a paraphrase. Two of them were going that very day to the village named Emmaus. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached. So these guys, of course, they ran back to Jerusalem. Wow, good. Well, look at this. Yeah, we saw him too. And he preached to 500. Josephus, a Roman historian, also a Jew, but a Roman historian, about this time there was a wise man called Jesus. Many people among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified. Uh, they reported that three days later he rose, and consequently he could have been the Messiah, and the Christians are still hanging around to this day. It's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses in the time of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events, which were fulfillments of specific prophecies. There are dozens of these. I'll give you a couple. Genesis 3.15, Messiah is to be born of a woman. Fulfilled in Matthew 1 and Galatians 4, God sent his son, born of a woman. Micah 5, 2, Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem. Well, lo and behold, Luke 3 says, as, uh, uh, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Psalms, uh, Psalm 35 and Psalm 69, the Messiah was hated without cause. John 15, 24 and 25, they have seen and yet they have hated both me and my father. Psalm 34 and Exodus 12, the Messiah's bones would not be broken. Messiah's bones would not be broken at crucifixion, a punishment that didn't exist then. John 19 says, when they came to Jesus, they did not break his legs. Psalm 22 in Zechariah 12, Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced in a punishment that didn't exist yet. This is prophecy. We'll get into prophecy next week. This is real prophecy. Can't be compared to what we actually see today. And John 20 Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, I will not believe. And of course, that's from doubting Thomas Didymus, Thomas the twin. And the last one, Psalm 16 and Psalm 49, Messiah would be resurrected from the dead. And of course, Matthew 28 and Acts 2, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. They report supernatural events, which were fulfillments of specific prophecies. And the last one, Divine inspiration. The claim that the writings are divine and not human in origin. Nehemiah 9. However you bore with them for many years and admonished them with your spirit through your prophets. 2 Kings 17. Yes, yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways, and keep my commandments, my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, and which I sent to you through my servants, the prophets. New Testament, Timothy, Second um, Timothy three sixteen, all Scripture is inspired. You, ones you well know, Hebrews Hebrews one, God after He spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many por- uh, uh, portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in His Son. And the last one, 2 Peter 1, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit. So, that's a lot. I just wanted to take a very big hammer and hit this flat. Now, I don't want there to be any doubt in your mind. It's a reliable collection of, his, uh, of historical documents written by eyewitnesses in the time of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events which were fulfillments of specific prophecies, and they claim that their writings are divine and not human in origin. Let us us, uh, close in prayer. Father, this is our prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that we may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, 
all to your glory and to your praise. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.